Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. Okay, guys, we've just engaged hostile force. Captain wants power redirected to forward shield stat. I'm on it. All right, stand by, stand by. Okay, I'm getting word for the captain. We need primary phaser control set to weapons. Secondary phasers powered up and on standby. No, no stat. I thought we were in an operating room, Tom. Stat! Stat! It's always stat! Okay, doctor. And acknowledged on it. No, Josh! Stop! I need to direct power to shield first. Oh, come on, Dan. Phasers are more important. No, we need power to shield. A strong defense is the best offense. You have Wait. that backwards, moron. Oh, kiss my ass. How's that for backwards? This is... I... Shit, why did power to my console die? Maybe because somebody routed power from your console to the phasers. Which is more important? Oh, for fuck's sake, are you kidding me? I... <laughs> okay, guys, 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 the shields are completely down now, and all the phasers are exploding! Yeah, I guess that's what happens when all the power is redirected to phasers, Josh. Oh, are you fucking kidding me? Uh... <clears throat> well, um... Okay, so I'm getting word. Decks 2 through 12 are breached, and the crew is venting into space. Captain wants an update. Oh, shit. Wait, what deck are we on again? Uh, 13. Yeah, 13. Oh, thank God. Whew. So what now, then? Should we try to help? Or do some repairs? Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. back to another far out episode of the fire pit i'm tom sith named darth stupidious and after showing we still ain't afraid of no ghosts we head off to where no person has gone before with tonight's film and as per our rules we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them to this one and now to tell us more about what we're watching and who we're watching i Send the calm over to Dan. Thank you, Tom. Dan here. Jedi name can't do it. And last week, we followed Bill Murray from a familiar day to a familiar role in Ghostbusters 2. And while the movie itself was pretty meh, what wasn't meh was the amazing Sigourney Weaver, who we'll be following to tonight's movie, only the fourth best Star Trek film ever, according to Reddit. I'm talking about 1999's Galaxy Quest, starring Sigourney Weaver, Tim Allen, and the ever-so-awesome Alan Rickman. And to tell us a little more about what we're watching tonight, I'm going to send things over to Josh. Thank you, Dan. The con is mine, not com. Tom. God. Short for console. How long have you been watching Star Trek? Com is in communication. It's con. You have the con. It's short for console. Moving on. <laughs> Josh here. <laughs> <laughs> 
bounty hunter named Klutzo Tripped, <laughs> as mentioned before, we're watching Galaxy Quest, a movie that is more than just a parody of Star Trek and Star Wars fans and similar sci-fi shows, and also a love letter to them. So, Galaxy Quest had a fun tagline of, the show has been canceled, but the adventure has only begun. Galaxy Quest was released December 25th, 99, has a running time of about 102 minutes, um, had a budget of about $45 million, and a box office return of about $90 million, has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 90%, and an audience score of 79%, which is close to in line to its IMDb score of 7.5 out of 10. That low? Wow. Well, it's a movie that everybody does enjoy, but it's also, like, I think we referenced in our uh, selection section how Space Jam was very well remembered, but very well acknowledged is not a great film. We'll obviously have more words on that, but worldwide, it had a box office return of $90 million, but domestically, it only grossed about $71.5 million. Now, honestly, when I was looking this up, I was a little surprised to learn that in its opening weekend, this movie did not ever get number one on the box office, and it actually only made number five during its third week of release. Uh, it was actually a pretty stout weekend for uh, Christmas 1999. It premiered at seven, pulling in about seven million dollars. Top movie that weekend was uh, Al Pacino, Jamie Foxx, Any Given Sunday. It was a football drama. Good film. Yeah, and number two was the Matt Damon, the talented Mr. Ripley. And then number three was We're Gonna Adopt a Rat Over Any of These Other Orphans and Stuart Little. <laughs> And then uh, at number four was Toy Story 2. And number five is a podcast favorite, The Green Mile, which was on its third week of release. Other notables in the box office during this particular weekend was Robin Williams' Bicentennial Man, Jim Carrey's Man on the Moon, Rob Schneider's Deuce Bigelow Mel Gigolo, James Bond's The World Is Not Enough, and way, way down on its 32nd week of release was Star Wars Episode One. The Phantom Menace, which at that point had pulled in $430 million, which at the time, obviously second only to uh, Titanic, was one of the largest domestic grossing films. And I think it had, at the time, it had the single one day box office gross. But I kind of want to put into perspective how poorly Galaxy Quest did in the box office, because for the year 1999, Galaxy Quest actually was uh, 94th on highest grossing movies. And this is just 99. I mean, it was out for a little over six days. But in the six days, it grossed twenty, almost $20 million. And obviously, the number one grossing film of that year was episode one, followed by Six Cents. Now, if you look where most of its money was made in domestic box office for 2000, Galaxy Quest actually uh, didn't do much better. It was number 48, pulling in $51 million for that year. Number one movie of the year 2000, Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch stole christmas oh so it was a very much a box office bomb especially if you calculate in double the price of the uh budget for advertising it barely broke even so it was kind of a dud in the box office which kind of explains why we haven't seen much of a uh sequel but it has quite a big cult following as star trek typically does in any you know to learn more about trivia on this film I'm going to send things over to Dan with that terrible segue. Um, actually, uh, funny you mentioned a sequel. There was plans for a sequel. It was even in the writing stage, um, in the planning stage or whatever the stage is before they get to principal photography. But um, they were in the writing stage of a sequel when Alan Rickman died. Pre-production? Pre-production stage when Alan Rickman died. And that kiboshed any uh, plans of a sequel. Although there are rumors that they are planning one now. But um, Alan Rickman's untimely death canceled plans for a sequel. I can see how they could do a sequel, but we can talk about that later because uh, this is Dan's time to shine. Yeah, this this movie, I, I honestly had to curb myself here a little bit. This movie is filled frame for frame with Star Trek references. I mean, I, I it was going crazy trying to find like all the trivia for this. But um, speaking of Ghostbusters, uh, you know, our connector is uh, Sigourney Weaver, who is uh, famous in the Ghostbusters movies, a director we're familiar with from two weeks ago in podcast time, but quite a while ago in our time. But um, Harold Ramis was originally attached to direct this film. He was a director of Groundhog Day and a writer on both the Ghostbusters movies. But uh, Harold Ramis was originally attached to direct. He wanted actually Alec Baldwin or Kevin Klein for the lead role. And the studio instead went ahead with Tim Allen as Jason Nesmith, which uh, prompted Ramis to leave the project as he was frustrated he couldn't cast who he wanted. 
it didn't leave out that both Alec Baldwin and Kevin Klein actually turned down the role before the, the offer was made to Tim Allen. But um, after the movie came out, Harold Ramis later admitted that he was wrong, that Tim Allen wasn't right for the role. Didn't hit Harold Ramis's vision for the movie like vastly different from what it wound up being? Um, yeah, originally it was supposed to be, I, I, want, I don't want to say darker in tone, but it was going to be more of an adult comedy. As opposed to a family-friendly comedy. Uh, it was going to be a rated R. It's going to have, uh, obviously, more F-bombs, possibly some nudity. I think there was a sex scene involved. It also changed studios. It was just supposed to be a Disney film. Or Disney was going to do this, and then it moved to DreamWorks. But uh, they changed it sometime during pre-production from a um, hard R comedy to a more family-friendly comedy in the vein of Ghostbusters or... Uh, Something like that. Um, but speaking of Tim Allen doing the lead role, he jumped at the chance to do this role. He was super pumped. He is a lifelong fan of science fiction, and his two favorite properties are Star Trek and Alien. He geeked out the first day Sigourney Weaver showed up on set and has said in many interviews that his dream was to be involved in some kind of Star Trek production. He always wanted to be a captain of a starship. That being said, I would love for him to be a voice on an upcoming season of Lower Decks. Because Lower Decks... Oh my god, yeah. Because, Dude, holy shit. Yeah, because Lower Decks is more comedy-focused. Probably why he never got a Star Trek role, because most Star Trek shows and movies are kind of on the more serious side. So, mm -hmm. I, but... Tim Allen does have really great comedic timing and he's got that, that iconic voice. Cause I mean, he's also buzz Lightyear, So I would love to hear Tim Allen be a voice of like a guest starring captain or some, or an admiral on lower decks. I think he'd be great, but I'm just, I was, he was super pumped. He had some alien memorabilia that he kept asking Sigourney Weaver to sign during the movie and all that too, which we would do too. If we were oh, on yeah. a movie with Sigourney, like sign yeah. whatever shit we've got. Yeah. Or like, you know, I've got so much Star Trek memorabilia that if I was in a movie with like any of the Star Trek alumni actors, I would constantly be going, sign my enterprise, sign my enterprise, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you drew a penis. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the Enterprise, the design of the ship in the movie, the NSEA Protector, is based on a Star Trek com badge. Also, the registry number for the ship is NTE-3160. NTE stands for not the Enterprise. <laughs> nice. I didn't know that. <laughs> and also, Alexander Dane, who is the character that Alan Rickman plays. Alexander Dane has a resentment for being typecast in the famous television role that he's in the, in the movie. Um, it reflects both... Leonard Nimoy, who went through a period of his life where he totally regretted being cast as Spock and he was typecast as Spock and he hated it. Um, and also, uh, it also mirrors Alan Rickman's own career. Um, after Die Hard came out, he kept getting typecast as villain characters and it kind of aggravated him a little bit because he just kept getting typecast as a villain. So he kind of poured a lot of himself into this role of someone who's kind of resentful of being typecast in, into one particular type of role. Um, and also the fact that both Alan Rickman and his character come from Shakespearean acting backgrounds. A lot of Star Trek alumni came from Shakespearean acting backgrounds too. William Shatner, Patrick Stewart, Christopher Plummer, Leonard Nimoy. Like a lot of them got their start in Shakespeare plays. Which you don't really think of when you think Star Trek. Well, it kind of depends. Like I, I remember years ago, Tom, we went to that William Shatner one man show and he talked about how he was on he did a lot of Shakespeare acting for like, like PBS type channels and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then when you watch the acting in the original series and how it was so bombastic and kind of over the top, especially from like Shatner and, and some of them, like you can kind of see where their stage Shakespearean acting came into play. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't Shakespeare, but they were acting like they were on a stage as opposed to a television show. Well, yeah. How would you put it that way? Yeah, it does. Okay, I can see it yeah. now. So contrast though, typecasting. Sigourney Weaver is actually playing against type. In this movie, she is almost always cast in every role she's in as a strong woman, very successful, cunning, brave, all of these things. Like Sigourney Weaver very rarely plays a damsel in distress. Even in Ghostbusters, when she's Dana, she's not the, your typical damsel in distress. Mm -hmm. um, however, in this movie, not the actress she plays, but the character she played within the show is a ditzy, big busted blonde chick whose only job is to repeat whatever the computer says. Mm -hmm. That's not what Sigourney Weaver plays. She's never made a career playing those types of roles. So she actually quoted saying, whatever I put the blonde wig on, which was her idea because she wanted to separate herself from Ellen Ripley. So she, she used a blonde rig wig in the movie, but she said, whenever I put the blonde wig on, I feel my brain cells leave my body. <laughs> <laughs> The other main ca actors in the movie are clearly based on main cast members of Star Trek, especially the original series. 
Tim Allen is very clearly William Shatner. Um, Gwen is Nichelle Nichols and almost all the other like Nurse Chapel and Yeoman Rand characters that were on the original series. Alan Rickman, Alexander Dane is Leonard Nimoy with a little bit of Patrick Stewart in there. Fred Kwan is a mixture of James Duhon and Walter Koenig, as in he's an actor playing a fake nationality. Because <laughs> uh, James Duhon was um, Canadian playing a Scot, and Walter Koenig is American playing a Russian. But also, actually, Fred Kwan, who's, who's um, oh, who was that actor's name? I, I just had it. Um, oh, 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 I had it in my head, too, and I blanked. Tony Shalhoub. Tony Shalhoub. He's Fred Kwan. He's actually, he's a mixture of James Duhon and Walter Koenig because he's an actor playing a fake nationality. But no, he has, his easygoing attitude is kind of both Duhon and DeForest Kelly uh, in real life. Like, DeForest Kelly was very laid back in the show during star Trek and during all the movies and all that. He was the easiest one to work with. He hardly had any kind of an ego. He didn't care. And Tommy Weber is the, the young kid or the kid that grew up to be the adult in the movie. Uh, He's a mixture of George Takai and Will Wheaton being a young ethnic minority who's stuck being the helmsman and the child prodigy, the Will Wheaton, Wesley Crusher child prodigy kind of Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. stereotype. Very um, next gen, yeah. Yeah, and I've only got two more really to talk about. Uh, one of them is, if you'll notice in the movie, Alan Rickman's character is never once seen without his headpiece on. Even in a, and there's one scene where he's in his hotel room talking on the phone with, I think, Sigourney Weaver's character. He's never seen without his headpiece on. Which I like. He's the one complaining about his role, but he can never leave his role. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the closest he gets is it gets kind of mangled towards the finale and you see some of his hair and all that sticking out of oh, the prosthetic. Yeah, after the fights and your stuff, yeah. Yeah, that's the closest you get. Um. And the movie is a definite homage of Star Trek, the fans, the actors, and even the franchise's popularity. J.J. Abrams later paid homage to this film in the 2009 Star Trek reboot with Kirk and Sulu falling towards Vulcan with no parachute and Chekhov beaming them up. That's actually a callback to this movie. Oh, because of uh, the, the when they're beaming them up from the rock scene. Yep. Yeah. So oh, I um, thought you were going to say like the whole like we when they're stuck in like the water pipes on the ship and it's like, why are these water pipes here? No. <laughs> they make no goddamn sense. And why is that there maybe... a giant whirling fan of death <laughs> in there? That might be true too, but I know that for a fact, J.J. Abrams specifically called back this movie when he talked about the Kirk and Sulu falling towards Vulcan with no parachute part and all that. And I don't want to go through all the quotes for all the different Star Trek alumni who love this movie, but I will say that Patrick Stewart thought it was brilliant. And he thought that the most amazing thing about the movie was that the reason why the actors who were supposed to be playing them were able to save the day is because there's fans who understand the actual science in the show better than the actors do. So that if they ever got caught in this kind of situation in real life, he would simply phone the most active Star Trek convention and he would be able to get out of this alive. AKA Dan. <laughs> AKA Dan. <laughs> yeah. So Sir Patrick Stewart, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably not, but just on the off chance that you are DM me, dude. Well, <laughs> I'll give you my number. If you ever find yourself beamed up to the enterprise, and you have no idea what to do. You give me a call. I know how it works. So, <laughs> and in the off chance, you find yourself in some weird star Wars, universe go ahead and give myself or or rob a call yeah and because yeah. if you listen to the podcast you know who rob is yes anyways that's all i've got well that's not all i've got i've got pages and pages of shit but um i don't want to be here all night and i want to start this movie at some point in time but tom before we start the movie i want to know about uh you know what's going on with this film well a lot of good things are going on with this actually show. we're out of time we need to go ahead and go to the next segment oh, oh okay sorry, sorry, sorry uh, tom uh, this is my big moment oh Darn it. Uh, can I record it anyways, just so I can feel good uh, about go myself? Ahead. All right. I mean, speaking of feeling good about this film, this film, just everything about this is just good. And it should be noted, we talked about advertising, the marketing behind this. Yeah, DreamWorks gave it almost no advertising budget. But, yeah, I've never heard of this happening before, but apparently the co-founder of DreamWorks, Jeffrey Katzenberger, directly apologized to Parasot for failing to market the film properly after having seen it. He apologized because apparently when it was premiering, most of the time it premieres, especially when it's so low, it drops off, but it kept rising. Like the word of mouth was bringing the film up in theaters. So if they had marketed it the way it should have been and not just push it out so it could compete against Stuart Little, it might have had a much better 
showing in the box office. So when the president and co-founder of your company apologizes for fucking up your film, that goes to show this is a pretty damn good film. For us, the three of us here who are watching this, I mean, we've seen this multiple times with adult eyes. We're all three sci-fi geeks. Two of us are unrepentant Trekkies. One of us is a second-generation Trekkie. We are the target audience. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Second-generation Trekkie? Me, baby. My dad was a first-generation. Okay. Yeah, he was Okay, I thought you were talking here. about me for some reason. I guess that's just me taking personal offense to everything. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, it's not all about you, Josh. Not everything is about you. Well, it is. It is. But continue. We, we, we really need to have an intervention for Josh's ego, Dan. I mean, this is just getting this is getting too much. It is. You tried that one time, but you couldn't get in the room with it. This is true. This is true. <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> but, but getting into this film, I mean, you had the director, uh, Dean Parasot. He might not have been the first choice. I mean, actually, no, technically he was the first choice, but the studio wanted Ramus. But then Ramus bowed out, so Parasot got what he wanted. He's the one that pushed for it to be kind of more comedy, because that's what he was most known for. And as Nigel said, every actor and actress who was on this film just fit. Sigourney Weaver in a sci-fi role. She's a queen of sci-fi. Of course you have her in this. You had Alan Rickman, the internet's goth uncle. Again, like Nigel said, Shakespearean actor trapped in a meme role playing a highly acclaimed Shakespearean actor trapped in a meme role. Sam Rockwell. I mean, if you want to go for the people like, oh my God, it's that guy, Sam Rockwell, essentially predicting his entire career by playing the guy who nobody knows, who <laughs> turns out to be the most badass character of all of them. Yeah, or steals the show when he's in it. Like he's, you know, yeah, he's very memorable. Oh, absolutely. And Daryl Mitchell, too. I mean, I don't know if you know this guy's career playing Tommy Pedal to the Metal Weber, but he's known for playing ensemble casts, some um, Fear the Walking Dead, NCIS New Orleans. He's just good at what he does. Plus, you got Tony Shalhoub, a character actor who's just really good at playing character actors. Jeebs in the MIB movies, Monk from TV, and also Splinter from the 2014 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I guess. Well, no, he, yeah. Yeah, that's weird. Actually, I just thought he did I, a pretty I, good job as Splinter. He was also on Wings. He was the uh, taxi driver on Wings. Oh, uh, no, no, no. We don't talk yeah. about the performance. We just don't talk about the movie. Oh, I like the sequel, though, because I like Nunchuck fans. <laughs> yes. I don't know. I've not seen the new ones. And then we have Tim Allen, who honestly, yeah, you're talking about Bicentennial Man premiering at the same time as this film. He turned down Bicentennial Man to be in this movie. Yeah. He, which, I, you look at it now, it's like, we don't remember Bicentennial Man much, but everyone remembers this film. This is Yeah, a he definitely film. picked the right one. Oh, yeah. I mean, Bicentennial yeah. Man wasn't a bad film. It was just forgettable. Definitely. So, I mean, honestly, yeah, Tim Allen's not exactly known for um, his acting chops. Let's be honest. He is essentially Tim Allen in every Tim Allen film he's in. But considering he's playing William Shatner, you want someone who can play a William Shatner role Without doing a William Shatner impersonation, I think that got that. Yeah, ham it up on sc on camera, yeah. He does yeah, a great he's job. he's kind of playing, you know, because his his character in Home Improvement was kind of sort of like William Shatner. Like he really thought he was like always. Well, yeah, he had the big ego and had the, you know, like even though Al on Tool Time was way more competent than he was, he always thought that I know best. And, he was incompetently competent. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just kind of like that. So I think he kind of plays his character from Home Improvement dialed up another notch in this movie. Like, mm -hmm. he definitely brought out his uh, Buzz Lightyear from uh, Toy Story yeah. in this role. But only parsed down a little bit just because, keep it realistic. We also have the aliens. We actually have a uh, connector in this Missy Pyle, a character actress. She plays Fran in Dodgeball and. Alexandra Cabot, the black haired chick with the white streak from Josie and the Pussycats. She did. Well, connector from one of our very early pre recording days. Also, for their first roles, we had Rain Wilson here. He plays one of the aliens. We know him best as Dwight from Office and Harold Mudd from Discovery. And also Justin Long, who would go on to be in Jeepers Creepers and accepted. 
but he yeah those are the only things first... that everybody knows justin long from you seriously go through his thing and those are the two things you pull out <laughs> well those are the ones most of us know. oh shush he was in dodgeball he was the i'm a mac from i'm a mac pc guy he was hey, in hey, like, hey 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 who's, who's in... in charge of the metadata here <laughs> well do a better who's job stepping on who's tra- <laughs> i'm trying to keep this under the five still minutes. waiting he was in oh, still my waiting god god that was the hilarious uh, movie. Uh, Josh, but the writers were the only outliers from this. David Howard and Robert Gordon, these were basically their first films. So, but everyone else who went into this either had some kind of connection to sci fi, as Dan said, or were like known uh, character actors and comedy actors. And it showed too. I mean, this film won an intense amount of awards. For this, it won the Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation, Nebula Award for Best Script. It was nominated for 10 Saturn Awards. Wow. I know, right? Alan won for Best Actor. Um, it's been voted the seventh best Star Trek film of all time by Trekkies. Um, I can't remember which which poll it was, but number seven, as you said, Nigel, was it like number four on a Reddit poll or something like that? Josh, Josh mentioned the Reddit poll, but yeah. Yeah. And yeah, but not not a lot of drama that went into this either. Just everyone loved doing this and loved being part of it. And I think, base even if I hadn't seen this film, I'd be expecting good things from this. But I've seen this film a couple of times. This is one of my go-to films where it's just like I'm having a shitty day. I'm going to try to find this online. Or uh, even before this, I try to rent it. It's just such a good Trek film. It's a pastiche. It loves its source material. It's one of those things like when you're like ribbing your friends, it's like, but you're like, ah, but I still love you. That's what this film is. It's just family friendly, tongue in cheek, Trekkie fun. All the actors just worked well with each other. The effects hold up still, although they're starting to show their age, but that happens with any film with early CG. Nothing about this is meant to be taken too seriously, and it doesn't take itself too seriously. I have fun every time I watch this film. It's so goddamn quotable in everything it does, and the love that went into this film really just shows and that's why it can still be so loved to this day it's maybe not no what no i put it up with it with some of the best trek films i would you can see it now i mean most pastiche trek films are actually just knockoff galaxy quests what's that one uh show that um um the family guy guy does right now? the orville yeah the orville that's essentially galaxy quest that's not cute so no you haven't seen it, have you? I have seen the Orville. It's essentially Galaxy Quest with less of the pastiche and more serious. I haven't seen the second season. Maybe he's gone a little more serious with it, but essentially he draws more on Galaxy Quest, and that's. Okay, I'm really going to question you of seeing seeing that. Like it's comedy, yes, but it's like Galaxy Quest is in universe. It's not an aliens coming and building a spaceship type it's, thing. This, I'll, I think okay. he's talking about how it's Galaxy Quest is like Star Trek more lighthearted and the Orville is Star Trek more lighthearted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm getting. Obviously, they're not like actors that were pulled up. Yeah, because there's been there's very serious episodes of the Orville that I would stack up against almost anything that Star Trek's done. Like, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and there's some serious stuff in Galaxy Quest, too. That's like you would stack up against some of the more serious scenes. But I think when we watch it, you'll see more what I'm talking about, because it's not been that long since I've seen it. it's not even been like a whole year, not even two years. But what about you, Dan? When was the last time you've seen this? And what are you expecting out of this viewing? <laughs> so my expectations um it hasn't been that long since i've seen this movie um believe it or not i actually if i do a star trek movie marathon rewatch i usually put this movie in there somewhere because it's it it's not as good as the great star trek films but it's better than the bad star trek movies and i don't know i think you benefit from this movie more if you're a diehard star trek fan like i am because the movie feels more like a love letter than a parody. Because especially since the, it, it's a fan that saves the day at the end of it. Like a fan, uh, yeah, it's a fan that figures out how it works. And I'm always reminded of when I went to that Star Trek convention a few years ago. And 
we were talking to Connor Trenier, the actor who played Trip Tucker on Enterprise, and one of the fans asked him, or no, they didn't ask him. So one of the fans asked him, like, what are the craziest questions you've ever gotten at a convention? And he says, and one time, it was about five years ago, five years from that point, but he goes, about five years ago, I had a question at a convention. Someone asked me, you know, the Enterprise could only go warp five if they'd have done this and this to the antimatter matter intermix ratio. The Enterprise could have easily broke the warp five barrier. And I was like, eh, the Enterprise only could go warp five because the script said it could go warp five. It had nothing to do with my qualifications as an engineer. <laughs> He's like, I literally played a space vampire after I got off of Enterprise. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like I didn't, but yeah, it's like it had nothing to do with me being able to get it past warp five. It didn't go any faster because the writer said it didn't go any faster. And that's what I love about this one. They, they find that one fan that would have asked him about that warp question. And he's the one that saves the day. So hats off to this movie. I, I can't say I'm expect what I'm expecting out of this movie. Cause I love this movie. It's one of my favorite movies of ever all time. But since we haven't done a star Trek movie on this podcast yet, my expectations are to sit back with my friends and watch a movie that I really, really, really enjoy in cleanse the palette that was ghostbusters 2 from last week nice what about you josh what are you expecting to get out of this movie how long has it been since you've seen it it's actually been a couple of years since i've seen this movie but i do i, I do want to say i know i've been a little snarky tonight and no, I just want to set the no, no, you no. Okay. You're fine. i do want to set the record straight i actually hate both of you <laughs> with all of my soul oh oh gosh he really does with care. all of my soul um all the little itty bitty black parts of it but um <laughs> no i love you guys who, who am i kidding <laughs> but uh no no I, I do like this movie it's been a few years since i've seen it um i don't feel like i need to use as much mouthwash uh, after last weekend because you know my feelings on ghostbusters but uh yeah i do enjoy galaxy quest it is fun film i love the humor in it i love how it uh tries to take itself seriously but it doesn't um you know more of what i'm getting out of i hope to get out of it tonight i'm hoping to get a good objective viewing on it tonight probably the last several times i've watched it like i always talk about i never fully pay attention to a film um unless it's like the first time i'm watching it or i'll just focus in on key scenes while it's playing um otherwise i'll be doing something else but uh i'm interested to just, like focus in on it and watch it objectively again for the first time in years mm. Because I don't, uh, I don't do that much to films anymore. Eh, well, most films don't exactly um... deserve my attention. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, like hell, even I, I say I, I know. Last week I talked about watching Ghostbusters just a few weeks prior. Like even then, I was probably I gave it maybe 10, 15 percent of my attention when I watched it, it's just because I've seen it so many times. It's like I know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. so, like when this movie came out in ninety nine, I remember I rented it and I watched it like every day for the entire rental period, which is like three or four days at the time or whatever it was. Multiple <laughs> viewings. Um, I've seen it a lot through the years. I think I own it on DVD, but yeah, it's I, I know what I'll be getting out of this and I'm hoping to enjoy. I know I'm definitely looking forward to hearing Dan talk about it and compare it to Star Trek. All kidding aside, Dan is like, we give him trivia for a reason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I brag about being a second generation Trekkie, but Dan is Trekkie. There's, uh, there's yeah, a yeah. clear distinction. Dan's daughter would be more of a here. second generation Trekkie than Tom could ever hope to be. Well, I'm <laughs> yes. not that I'm not that point zero one percent fan where I, the line between reality and, and fantasy blurs for me. But you are the type of fan where if I have a Star Trek question, it's easier to call or text you than actually go on the website and search for it myself. Right. But I would if I had been in the audience that day where that fan asked Connor Trenier that question, like or asked him someone, you know, if they had just mixed the antimatter to matter ratio this way and that way, the Enterprise could have broke the warp five barrier. I'd have been nodding my head. I mean, he's right. I, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't. I, I mean, I, I know it's just a TV show and it, it's not real. And, and I know the, the, the ship only went warp five on Enterprise because the writing team said it went warp five. But I mean, he's right. If you guys had just done that, it would have easily gone past warp seven. So, I mean, you know. <laughs> and that's why Dan's not allowed back at conventions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the reason they're all canceled, not the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know what? We're never going to get this movie started unless we 
you know, move along here. And we all know we are going to love it. We are going to love it. We all three have seen it, loved it. Tom, what have other people thought about this movie? Yeah, that's what I was about to... Do you need a minute there, Josh? Did you, uh... (laughs) I just love it. I hate you so much. (laughs) I don't know if I want to do this now. (laughs) Let the hate flow through I'm, you. Next week, I'm the Sith Lord. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so quiz time, fellas. Um, if we're talking about hate, well, guess what? Oh, God. Uh, not a lot of hate in this film. Actually, a lot of this, I was very hard-pressed to find any low-ranking reviews on this. But you know what? You still have to figure out which one is which. So as per the standard rules, I have scoured imdb for user reviews one to ten stars and i will be giving you five reviews uh one at a time and you have to guess how many stars each review is one through ten closest gets a point you get exactly on the money you get two points um one with the most points at the end of five reviews wins and gets to do the quiz next week person that loses shames her house and are kicked off of the klingon high council only if you do as poorly as dan did last week i did bad and against me too there is no coming back from that (laughs) shame my grandchild my grandchildren will bear the shame of my dishonor (laughs) but do not worry dan because i have honor and i will allow you the first chance to regain your honor so, oh, this, sweet. I know, right? Never say I didn't do anything for you guys. Okay, so this review comes from Feast Mode, who said, Cool idea, some funniness, some cleverness, mostly terrible, one viewing. Wow. Uh, I'm going to say two stars. Gosh. Say it one more time. Cool idea, some funniness, some cleverness, but mostly terrible one viewing. I kind of want to say one star, but I feel like I should say three star. Three star. You're saying three star? Uh, don't make me regret this. Three star, yeah, I'm going to go three star. This is not a good start for you, Dan. That's He's right on the money. Yeah, Holy dad. shit. Because I was going to go with four, but I'm like, that feels like it's either a three or a one based off of the, the uh, title. <laughs> I thought the one viewing would throw you guys off. Maybe think it was like like a one star review. So That's what okay. I thought, but I decided to go with the, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should have let Josh go first, Dan. I'm sorry now. Oh, my God. Eh, whatever. It is what it is. It's okay. Dan will be the Tom this season. I'm okay only six, with that. It's only six times six weeks. Wait, no. Six times seven weeks. It's only 42 weeks, Dan. Come on. Moving on. Okay, so Josh, this one comes from Tomimpt. I don't... Yeah, Tomimpt? To Mimpt. I have no idea how to pronounce his name. They say, can Trekkies laugh at themselves? I hope so. Trekkies laugh at themselves. I hope so. Are these the titles or just a line out of the review? Line out of the review. I'll let you know if it's the title of the review. Okay. Um... Let's go six. I'm going to go six out of ten. Six? Okay. Nigel? Um, four out of ten. Four out of ten? Josh is closer. It's an eight out of ten. Nice. <laughs> Oof, boy. I mean, still early, Nigel. You can still pull it off. I don't know. I lost my touch somewhere in the off season. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> You could still win it. We've had crazier comebacks. I, yeah, but I'm not just not feeling it anymore. I'm like, you know, I used to be really good at this, but oh well. You, you've you've lost the touch. I have. You've you've lost the power. <laughs> He's lost that love and feeling. Both of you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we go, Dan. Um, maybe you can come back from this third one here. This one comes from W. H. Cernan, and the title is. Second best Star Trek movie ever. Seven out of ten. Josh? Uh, I want to say eight out of ten just to price is right. Yeah, I'm going to go eight out of ten. You're the biggest dick in the world, Josh. Yeah, it's a nine out of ten. Oh, that was my other guess. I would have gone with a nine. I should have gone with a nine. I could have got the double points. Damn. Well, Nigel, you can still come back from this if you get both right on the money. Okay, so this one comes from Ilo Equipamantos. 
as one sentence. A really bright idea, the premise see what undoubtedly auspicious, meanwhile the bad screenplay spoils everything too contrived and the whole casting don't help Newt too much. The cast acceptable casting come from Alan Rickman as a fed up character who has something as Mr. Spock likes. It seems a bit with Star Trek series where William Shatner, that according some reliable sources, has the same bad behavior of Tim Allen's character in real life requiring limo. Maybe it was all a little criticism over those former Star Trek actor. I've heard some comments on Roswell's series over this matters clearly driven to Shatner could you read that again wow okay so <laughs> one one did he purposely type this without using the space bar or I mean <laughs> I mean they at least put in some commas obviously Use them when you read it um, yeah I will go <laughs> slow <laughs> not uh, too slow that was incredibly was long. that just like one sentence though that was all one sentence. No punch. No periods. Wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, Let me take a drink. Um, this no oh, starts with Josh now. Josh gets this one. Hmm. So I said, read it again. <laughs> a really bright idea. The premise was undoubtedly auspicious. Meanwhile, the bad scream play spoils everything. Too contrived. And the whole casting don't help too much. The most acceptable acting come from Alan Rickman as a fed up character who has something as Mr. Spock likes. It seems a bit with Star Trek series where William Shatner, that according some reliable sources, has the same bad behavior of Tim Allen's character on real life requiring limbo. Maybe it was a little criticism over those former Star Trek actor. I've heard some comments on Roswell series over this matters clearly driven to Shatner. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So this is either a, a 10 star review because this guy also probably loves the Transformers series. I'm going to go five, five out of 10. I'm going to say two. Final answer, guys. Yeah. Josh is closer. It's a six star. Wow. Man, I'm going to be like the Cincinnati Reds. I'm going to go like five games on scoring a point. Oof. Yeah, that was what, the fourth question? Yeah. That was fourth one, so we still got one more. Um, so, so I got one, think... two, three, four. There's okay, no way I can win, though, even if I get the, the, yeah, this one yeah. right on the money. I'm, I'm, I'm up by five. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Okay, so... Um, so your goal is to at least score this one so you beat the spread from last week. <laughs> Okay, so this one, Nigel, comes from Texas Reg, and the title of their review is Sci-Fi Comedy? That concept has never worked. Five. Josh. You said this was the title? Yes. Um, six. Josh <laughs> sweeps. Wow. Untouched. <laughs> You know what? Now it's going to be in my head now, too. Because now I'm just going to start overthinking it. <laughs> wow. One, two, three, four, five, six to nothing, Josh. Oh, my God. You couldn't even give him a pity one. Now, I don't what want pity. I don't one? want pity. If I suck, I need to suck. One? What now? What was the last one? You did give the score. You said I got closest, but you didn't say what it was. Oh, oh, hang on. Let me, I let me pull that back up. Um, so let's see. Uh, oh shoot, now it's, it's a seven-star review. Uh. Yeah, so you were close. <laughs> oh my God, Josh, you should be ashamed of yourself. What are you talking about? I won. Yeah, no, I'm ashamed. Don't worry, I am. <laughs> oh, but there was no honor in that one. The man was down, and you kept kicking him and kicking him, and then you just. You went to his dog and you kicked that too. My oof. Well, I can oh. tell whose team Tom is on. I was, I mean, at first it was like, yeah, but it's like the fight club scene where he's just like <laughs> Tyler keeps punching the dudes like, stop it, stop it. He's already dead. I wanted to destroy something beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, man, I'll own it. I'm sucking right now and now it's going to be in my head. Uh, it, 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 it's it's um it's not good. I'm like a quarterback who just threw like six interceptions in one game. The next time he gets behind center, I'm going to be like, this next pass is going to be an interception again. <sighs> well, I hopefully you'll, had... you'll uh, get a home run on the next uh, next inbounds goal. That's – you okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Should have had the fat lady sing sooner. Oh, my God. I'm waiting for someone to say Tom played the music. Tom played the music? There we go.
Welcome back to another galaxy spanning episode of the Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and intrepid captain, Tom. And allow me to extend to you the universal greeting for We Come in Peace. Oh shit! Oh, that was supposed to be the cupcake button. Oh, I hope that wasn't one of their critical systems. <laughs> but thank you for joining us on another critical mission as the fire pit strikes back. Literally taking this galaxy quest on our way to the Empire Strikes Back. It's going to be one heck of a five-year mission, and by five-year we mean six-movie mission, but we're glad to have you on board. So sit back, take a calm, pull up something green, and enjoy the quest. And speaking of questing, let's see if the team's quest is going any better this time around. Okay, I'm getting word for the captain. We have encountered a new species, and apparently a dialect similar to a known species language. All right, all right, so all we need to do is route any communications we receive through a translator. Should be simple enough. Uh, okay, uh, so what's the first message we need to send? Say bye. Okay, captain says just start with the standard greeting. Uh, we're from the Federation of Collective Knowledge Unification Pact. We come in peace. Peace. We we come in peace. Oh my god. Whew. We cannot fuck this communique, guys. Okay, I mean... Odd dialect, but uh, I think the message works. Message sent. Alright, and they responded. Gonna go ahead and forward it to the bridge. And the bridge has received. Good job, guys. Alright, so... Oh, and... Now the captain wants us to send a message back uh, offering assistance in their colonization efforts. Just be sure to keep it simple. Okay, hold on. I've handled this kind of negotiation before. Now remember, keep it simple. Dan, I think you want to maybe rework that message because, you know, given this particular dialect and how literal these translations will go through, the way you just set it up I think it's going to come off as hostile. It's perfectly fine. Seriously, I think it could be phrased better. It's fine. Message sent. Message sent. Okay, um, guys? I'm getting word they've raised their shields. I think they took it as a hostile message. Oh, what did I tell you? <laughs> you know, it's not like that dinky ship could actually put up a fight anyway. We'd blow them out of the freaking sky. Message sent. Oh, shit. Uh, guys, they have apparently powered up all their phasers and are demanding our surrender now. <laughs> Serves you right. <laughs> fuck around and find out. Why don't we tell them to just go fuck themselves? It's not like we're the flagship of the fleet or anything. Pissing and scrub plant people. Message sent. Wait, what? Real smooth there, Dan. Did you just single-handedly ruin this thing and then tell them to go fuck themselves? Maybe. Ugh. Yeah, they fired on us. Decks 2 through 12 were breached, and the crew is venting into space. Captain wants an update. Uh... Oh well, even James Kirk had to lose the no-win scenario twice before he got it right. If pulling off a peaceful hello was easy, everyone would be doing it. But if you want to give us a hello, or if you want to exchange money for getting an ad on our podcast, feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put fire pit in the subject line, as well as the purpose of your communications, whether it's for an ad, an episode idea, a journey, destination, a ship status, a distress signal about your planet being devoured by a crystalline entity, and open the frequency at your leisure. Then we'll receive your communication. 
read it under a secure channel. Kidnap a bunch of B-list Hollywood stars, have them take over the mission, and never respond. It's never give up, never surrender. Not never give up and respond to your emails. Come on! But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. Oh shit! Oh! Uh oh! Oh, it looks like the other ship has mixed up their cupcake button too! Oh, don't you hate when that happens? Time for some evasive maneuvers while you get back to the show! Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. Oh shit! I'm a podcast host, not a ship captain! What the shit, man? Jesus, go! And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. Like Connor Trenier said, the Enterprise's engine room had a fan that squeaked. And they had to go oil it between takes so that it wouldn't pick up on the microphones. <laughs> That's why it couldn't go past warp five. That's what he would say. <laughs> Your order, sir. Ham it up on screen. Hmm, 90s Tim Allen. Oh my. Look at that dad bod. Holy crap, that's a Discovery Klingon. Doesn't that guy look like he was dressed like a Discovery Klingon? He's absolutely a Discovery Klingon. 20 years before they were invented. Sam Rockwell is forever going to be 35. Bunch of losers! They can for autographs at 15 bucks a pop. 15? I know, I'll take an autograph at 15. <laughs> I still love this scene. I would be filling that bubble up so quick. I'm suffocating. See, this is what Tom did to fill the jizz jar last week. <laughs> Gross. Saris's ship is a homage to the Doomsday Machine. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Dude, okay, the biggest flaw of this scene is how everybody just left from getting autographs. Yeah. They would be like, dude, I, I, I've been waiting. I, I want an ad autograph. Yeah. I paid for this. I paid $15 for this. There's a funny story for a scene coming up here in a minute. Apparently, that was unscripted, because if you look at Sigourney Weaver's reaction, that was genuine. <laughs> she was genuinely shocked. That was, that, was, that was my story, but okay. <laughs> Way to go, Josh. I mean, you beat him at quiz. I just like kicking him while he's down. <laughs> it's when they go home. I say the word, we'll go home. Feed our bills, feed our fish. Fall asleep in front of the TV and miss out on all of this. Okay, all those sound pretty nice. I'm not going to lie. This pissed off William Shatner. Why? He wanted rock monsters in Star Trek V, and they told him they couldn't do it. <laughs> he was uh, After he got done watching the movie, one of the things he said about it was, I'm so glad special effects have come such a way now that they can do rock monsters in movies. <laughs> Rockwell's expression is perfect. <laughs> it's even funnier if you've already seen this, and you, you know that he always played a guy that died in the show. She's like, he's just like, he's counting down the minutes. <laughs> he has a very particular fetish that he's going to get. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Gross. <laughs> the protector and his command crew have escaped he custody. does sound so much. <laughs> oh, God. Green blood, okay. <laughs> God, I wish Leonard Nimoy was still alive to give me my dying words. No, he's orgasming. He's not dying. He just orgasmed himself to death. Well, there's a reason why the French call it the little death. <laughs> I understand completely that it's just a TV show. I know there's no, no ship. It's all real. Oh my God, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, this is I, me. Yep, this yep, is yep. me. That would be me. Any Star Trek alum was talking to me on a communicator. It's all real. Yes, I know. I knew it. <laughs> so why are you filing this insurance claim? Well, apparently my car was flipped about 40 feet up in the air by what? A spacecraft? Yes. Is that at the same uh, convention where six people died when the building exploded or whatever? Yeah, when the spacecraft ran into the building. Yeah, you're not covered under that. Sorry. You only have liability. 
Dude, how awesome would that be? Getting to kiss Sigourney Weaver. Especially since he's an alien fanboy. Like, yeah. t- Tim Allen, like, Alien's one of his favorite films of all time. Alien and Aliens. How many retakes did you think he insisted on? Oh, Shut I fucked on. it up. Time to do it again. Oh, I fucked it up. Time to do it again. I think Sigourney Weaver's a little too wise to let that slide a little bit. And, you know, depends on uh, how good a kisser he was. I mean, they called him the two old man for a reason. The two old man or tool man? The tool man. Because it sounded like Tom said the two old man. Well, it depends on how bad he kisses, too. I mean, this is accurate. I think we just missed something. What'd they say? Good question. We were talking over it. And now, back to the episode. I love that movie. Uh, That was awesome. My God, is this movie awesome. Yes. All right. So that was Galaxy Quest. Uh... We seem to have enjoyed it, but I want to get deeper into some final thoughts, and we're going to start with Josh. Hooray! So, Galaxy Quest was a lot of fun. It's one of those movies where, going into it, sometimes I feel like I don't want to watch this movie because I know exactly what it is. In my head, I'll like uh, basically equate it to like driving on a car trip or something. I know what I'm getting into. It's the same ride over and over again. It's fun, but it's not going to be as good as the first time. And then after I watched it, I'm like, holy shit, that was awesome. Whatever the fuck was I even thinking about? I mean, you ever get like that with a movie where it's just like, I don't want to watch this movie because I know what I'm going to get. But then after you watch it again, you're like, why was I having those thoughts beforehand? Oh, yeah, I've had that thought on a couple movies in this journey where, like, I'm kind of, like, not looking forward to doing the recording and watching the movie again. But then we're getting into the movie. I'm like, ooh, I'm enjoying this. Yeah, it's like that's 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 what this was for me coming into it tonight. Like, I was excited about watching it because I do like the movie. I remember really enjoying the movie. I've enjoyed it every single time I've watched it in the past. But I was just like, I wasn't pumped to see it like I have been other movies. And then I get done with the movie and I'm like, that was awesome. Why did I ever think that? So now that I've said the same thing three times, three different ways. <laughs> you want to try to get a fourth one in? Just uh, make it an even number? I, uh, I'll, I'll, if I don't get it in before the end of my final thoughts, I'll cut one of you guys off. Awesome. Hey, cool. That's what I do. You know, like, I don't know. I, I do love this movie. I think one thing that I really, like, saw it differently over the previous times that I've seen this is it, it helped because you guys were constantly pointing out too is their facial expression. You know, the art of acting is the art of reacting. I don't know how many times I've said that on this, but uh, actually I've, you haven't said it at all. Really? I've this said this a couple of times. <laughs> they say acting is the art of reacting. And I would have to say that this movie definitely shows that. Yeah, he said, he's, he's See how said many times before. Tom listens to his own edits, but no, I've said it quite a few times. It's been a few episodes, but I have said it. But acting is the art of reacting. So, like, I think this movie is a perfect uh, example of that. Just the way that, especially Sam Rockwell's character, the way he reacted to every scene and reacted to the other actors. And all of their expressions, scene to scene, just felt genuine and hilarious. Like, they were a bunch of actors caught in an extraordinary situation. And they just didn't know how to react to that. And that was their reaction. So watching that this time, being able to see, especially uh, Laredo, the kid who played Laredo, what was his name? Tony Weber. Um, ex- that one scene when he was piloting it out of the dock was hilarious. <laughs> right? And then not just him, but then like every other bridge crew on there, just this, they had the same type of expression, like nails on the chalkboard, like, Eeeh! Yeah, that, that, that would be my takeaway from this particular viewing is their reactions and how they uh, played off of each other. I would say that it's like two weeks in a row we've had two movies that had a really amazing ensemble cast that played well off of each other. Although this movie is yeah. significantly better than last week's movie. Mm-hmm. But, By uh, far. Yeah, that's all I've got for me now at this moment. So I will happily cut you guys off later on whenever I have more thoughts. But let's, uh, Dan, what are you? thinking about this oh god Uh, so much to say about this film i I love it so much Uh, you know being the diehard trekkie that i am that i used to say that my love of star trek was nearly fanatical nearly religious it's not it's 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 a full-blown fanatical religion (laughs) now um i've been radicalized (laughs) so um but this movie is so like it, it's not hateful or spiteful to Star Trek fans uh, or, you know, or the cast and crew 
of those shows and the franchises and all that. It definitely is a love letter to those fans. And I, I said it in my initial expectations and stuff in the movie. I love the fact that it's a diehard fan that basically saves the day that they, they call a diehard fan up and get him to get his other diehard fan friends to tell him where to go on the ship and what to do and all that stuff. Cause it's like, they knows it better than them. And I just, I don't know. I just, I love that. I love that about him. I love how the crew started off as being kind of like united in their hatred of Tim Allen's character, but then they all like grew to love each other again. I don't know. This is just this movie. The, the, the actors and actresses are so well cast in this film. I mean, I know like Tim Allen's not that big of an actor. He's been mostly TV roles. And then like, you know, he's obviously the boys of Buzz Lightyear and the Santa Claus and all that. But like, like Tim Allen, he brings this like larger than life kind of character. He really is a, a pretty good pastiche of of uh william shatner especially if you read stories of how shatner acted when he was on the original series and in some of the star trek movies i mean you know him and takei are still basically on non-speaking terms like Mm -hmm. you know george takei uh, sulu in star trek for the non star trek fans in the audience the two of them and i guess a lot of uh tim allen and alan rickman's character work on the movie their their storyline was kind of mirrored between george takei and william shatner but yeah i i don't know it's just i know a lot of the real behind the scenes stories of of all the star trek shows current and pre- in the past so this movie kind of like i don't know it it, it it scratches an itch for me like they really did their homework on this movie and i'll add some more thoughts after tom gives his but yeah so my final thoughts are this movie is just brilliant in its homage to Star Trek, just its love of the franchise and the fans of that franchise. So, Tom, what are your final thoughts? Oh, for me, I mean, there's there's always like that weird dichotomy when we do films we haven't seen versus films we have seen just like 100 plus times. Um, with a new film, it's like you're surprised to to just experience it for the first time. Everything's new and fresh whereas when you've it's a film you've seen a hundred times especially if it's a film you love sometimes you find yourself surprised at what you haven't noticed like the 99 times before groundhog day for me always is that despite me literally seeing it a hundred times and this one too just i, I mean I, I kind of build on some of this not just like the the actors and their just expressions and how they played off each other and reacted to the scenarios and just leaned into everything. But a lot of the directing choices, there was a lot of clever directing going on here, such as like the scene where everyone else comes onto the ship for the first time after they've gotten basically alien probed and they're going through the the corridors of the ship and everything's kind of like the angles are getting like swaying and wonky and everything's not quite at the level it's like because they are just like being overwhelmed where where they are i thought that was a very great choice to just show how crazy their scenario was or how that whole reveal when tim allen's in the room and just like everything goes like cinematic wide angle for him it's like yeah versus directors like michael bay michael bay doesn't know how to just not use the most intense directing for any scene everything's got to be like a music video this one's like the director knew when to make it looks like grounded everything steady cam that sort of thing and when to just like really just do fun stuff with it and just like really make the cameras work to bring out the emotion of the scene and i, I just appreciate the director's work on this I, I don't think he did too much before this but Holy cow, did he bring it. And the small things I noticed, too, with not just the directing, but the acting, too. Especially Tim Allen's character. They laid some groundwork on, like, the character-building moments. The things that they would help them through. Like, Tim Allen's character, like, in the beginning, when he was with the fans, and they were, like, asking him all these fan questions. Like, well, what about this? What about this? But he was able to kind of, like, go with the flow, with the questions, no matter how ridiculous it was, and just give them an answer that not only satisfy them but kind of made sense and like the scene where in the they're in the um the chow hall and the aliens were asking him something and all the actors kind of just looked to him like uh and he's like oh well this is well the 
that's we think the Omega 13 does this or whatever. I can't remember specifically, but he was able to do that. And he was the commander. It's just he knew how to do it. And everyone else like had their own tiny story arcs where they like yeah. they use whatever that their character was in the show to kind of become well, better people and just better characters. They became their characters by the end of it. I thought that was really good. It loved its source material, it loved its fans, loved the people that loved it back. And I just appreciate that. It's, yeah. Now that's yeah, actually, why it stands. But go ahead, Nigel. You have a thought? Um, actually, a lot of um, Star Trek alumni were hesitant about this film. And in fact, they did. They won a couple of them wanted nothing to do with it, like Patrick Stewart and. Um, George Takei and, and quite a few others because they thought it was going to be a mean spirited parody. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, and on its they, surface, doesn't it? I mean, imagine the yeah, pitch but, of this movie. Oh yeah. Star Trek, but the actors get sucked into a real life Star Trek scenario or something like that. Like, mm-hmm. but they thought, they thought it was going to be a mean spirited parody. And since after the show's end, some of those Star Trek actors depend on the fans to buy their autographs and stuff at conventions and all that. They didn't want to be in the movie because they didn't want their fans to think that this is what we really think of you, that you're, you know, basement dwelling mama's boys, pimply faced nerds, you know, they don't want, they, they didn't, they were so afraid. They were afraid that we don't want our fans to really think that this is what we think of them. So they didn't go and they didn't want anything to do with it. They didn't do cameos or nothing. Mm-hmm. And Jonathan Frakes went to see this movie and then called Stuart and a couple of other Star Trek next generation alumni and said, you guys need to go see this film and you need to go see it in a packed theater. It is not mean spirited at all. It's a love letter. Like it is a, you guys mean so much to us kind of a movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's, I, that's, I think that's brilliant. I think that this, that's why this movie still kind of has that. Um, oh, I'm, I, I, I can't think of the term, but the, the, this movie has fondness, has fondness with a lot of star Trek fans because it's not mean spirited. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, it's it doesn't treat star trek fans like they're a bunch of loser nerds oh yeah it definitely definitely doesn't you're right in that 100 percent. the story that this movie tells is not exactly new it's been done before again fright night and several others but at the same time it's just you can appreciate that story because it's just so well told it's like the fish out of water the actors like they they're looked to to be the authority in this because they've played this role it's like, no, I'm not this guy, but now I guess I got to be this guy. And you watch them kind of adapt to the situation. You root for them because they're not bad people. They're, I mean, Nesmith's a little a bit of a self-centered prick. They're all kind of a little vapid and a little bitter about their past. But that's a, a tale as old as time right there. So it's not, it's something that any other audience, whether you're Trekkie or just a TV fan, whether you're like a Gilligan's Island fan, you can watch this and go, yeah, yeah, I can see aliens kidnapping Gilligan and the Skipper to get them off a deserted island. I'd watch that movie. But yeah, I mean, um, I wish I could have something to nitpick about with this film, but there's I've, there's nothing really to nitpick. It was just so damn good. Yeah. The movie held itself very well above water. There's a lot of exceptional parts to this film. I can't think of a lot of bad parts. Yeah, and it's it's paced very well. It, I didn't yeah. feel like this movie slows down unnecessarily at any point in time. Like it doesn't get boring, and um, it stays pretty action packed throughout the whole film. And you know, it, and there's not a, I don't know it's it, it's not a perfect film, but I can't really find the flaws. You know what I mean? Like yeah, that's one what of I'm those trying things. To say. Like, yeah, I agree. It's it, like what I'm trying to say is like it's not like you get some of the really good films that are just awesome. They have their lows, but they're not a lot of them, but they're exceptionally great films. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This one, it's like, it has its peaks of being really awesome parts, but it's not like great all the way through. It's like, it, it lacks, it, it lacks the finish. You know, it's like they say the polish on the end to make it just like really, really great. It's our, it's an amazing story. Everything's good about it. It's just, it lacks something that just would push it into the amazing category. I think the so stakes. Like you know, oh, sorry, Josh, I stepped on your toes. Yeah, you oh, can- you know, that, that's maybe very true is the stakes, but yeah, it's just like it lacks something. It's an ingredient that it's missing just to give it that, you know? Mm-hmm. But beyond that, I think it's a great film. It's like you order a pizza and it's a great pizza. Back to our food analogies. Drink. <laughs> drink. Yeah, drink, drink audience. Take drink. a drink. 
Um, it's a great pizza. It's not the best pizza you've ever had, but it's definitely a really, really good pizza. Mm-hmm. Yeah, although if our it, audience takes a drink for every Star Trek reference, they are so drunk. In this yeah, episode. they didn't finish the episode. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're dead. dead. We, we, have a, we have a kill count now, guys. We yeah, are responsible yeah. for many deaths. Yeah. We intro, intro, connections run down. Yeah, intro Connections Rundown did them in. You know, I'm gonna, it, they would have been dead by the time uh, we got to, to uh, was it Dan? Yeah, <laughs> or Tom? They would have been dead by the time they got to Tom. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> no, I'm gonna. I think my edits. I'm gonna have to put in like disclaimer. If you do the Trek drinking game, don't do it for this episode. You will die. But I think really to this film's credit, and maybe to its detriment too. You're talking about the thing that keeps this film from being like oh my god, wow, that grand scope is because the stakes are personal. These aliens need these actors to save them. But if Sarah gets this device, it's not going to be the end of the universe. It's, I mean, he's going to have a reset button. Goes back 13 seconds. They die, sure, but Earth continues on. The universe continues on. There's no one... Aside from this almost extinct species, no one's heard these actors. They die. I mean, it's not like they're the president of the world or like the scientist with a cure for cancer. They're a bunch of B-level, C-level actors and actresses doing conventions and signing autographs at car factory openings. That's it. So for them, it's it's one of those movies where the stakes are high for them, but not high for everyone. Yeah, yeah. They're high for the characters, not high for the uh, universe at large. Mm -hmm. The other aspect is it could also be the fact that the population, humankind, doesn't know about their achievements. Yeah. Like, this is all happening to nobody's knowledge except for the cast and the small group of people on Earth. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's like... We see them doing this, but they're going to get back. They're going to want to ch- be like, oh, my God, we just ex- had this great, huge experience that nobody knows about. Yeah. And I think in the back of our minds, we all knew that, too. And that just kind of, like you said, take takes the stakes away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Takes I- away from the stakes. Now I want stakes. <laughs> But no, I felt like when they offered them, like, don't you want to come with us? I honestly would have took them on that offer. I would have, like, if they want to do sequels, like, these guys are now captains on a space vessel. I, I would suggest, yes, two times yes, please. I will be your captain. Where are we going next? Uh, back home, I'm just a washed up actor. <laughs> Here, I am the captain. Yeah. Oh, my God. And Imposter syndrome be damned. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just beat an alien dude. What's next for me? Come on. Let's let's bring it. And so, I mean, they talk about doing a sequel. I think you could do a sequel. I think you honestly could. And it would have to deal with, like, new quests. They would have to parody all the new Trek stuff happening right now. Oh, yeah, that would be good. Like, the movie gets rebooted. All the, Like, all the cast disappears after their second series was canceled. Mm-hmm. And then uh, they rebooted into a movie franchise. Yes. Alternate universe type thing. And then the new cast gets abducted like two or three years after the movie is premiered. And they do terrible because they they don't care. They are just bullshit actors. Or well, no, they come up and they find that the uh, original crew is still in the old one. But then the rebooted ship gets made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just like, it would have to be like a take that to new Trek. Whereas this one's a love letter. Yeah, but see, that, but that would diminish this one. Because I, as I said, you this this movie works and it's so fondly remembered. And it's it, it still holds a good uh, place in Trek fans' hearts. Because it's not a take that. It's not a fuck you to Star Trek. It's not a middle finger. It's not mean spirited. And if you made a sequel that was mean spirited and, and, and you treated the new Trek fans, whether they're fans of the new movies or they're fans of the new shows. Yeah, as, it can't be a fuck you. Yeah, it can't be. It cannot be a, a gatekeeping wank fest because it, yeah, that would just, that would be really bad because even though like I may not personally like Star Trek into darkness, there's fans of that film and, and it may have brought them into Star Trek. Like that may have been their gateway into Star Trek or mm-hmm. I thought the third season of discovery wasn't very good, but there's fans that really like discovery and think it's the best star Trek show ever. 
I don't want to gatekeep and, and tell them that they're wrong because it's not Deep Space Nine or the next generation. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think the same way, like, I, I think a sequel being a take that to New Trek would be the wrong way to go because definitely the wrong message. It would, it would definitely be, it would be, it would be wanking off the gatekeeping fans and gatekeeping fans of both star Trek, star Wars, and almost any franchise are like the worst. Yeah. Cause you got to <laughs> keep in mind, it's not this, this show wasn't about the crew like at all. The show was about the fans. Yeah. yeah. So that's what the sequel, if we, there was ever a sequel, that's what that would have to be about would have to be the fans. Like, but the only ca- catch would have to be is Zoe Saldana would have to be in it. Period. Just there's oh, no. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. You're absolutely right. You're you're both right on all counts so far. Yes. Yeah. I mean, like you could probably do it like in a sense of like maybe they rebooted the new the series into a movie, and they recasted everybody, and the new cast gets beamed up to the ship. Yeah, that's and- what the. But they said they don't. No, no, no. But I was saying, but they don't have the years of experience of doing the TV show that this crew had. Cause like, you remember, like they started to remember like how the episodes worked and that's how they yeah. were able to start figuring out the ship. Like, Oh, that's how it works because I did it this way in episode 82 or I did it this way in episode 17 or whatever. Like, but like, if, if like, let's just say they beamed up the new Trek crew. There's only three new Trek movies. So they'd be like, we've only got three movies to draw from. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. Oh, you know, that would be awesome. It's like, they couldn't, uh, the new guys, Playing on that, you would have to have the new Galaxy Quest crew, the re- the alt universe Galaxy Quest crew, try to do something logically, and be like, "Oh no, this is what we would have to do because this is what would make sense, right?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, no, 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 no. Yeah, and also like it would be funny like if if parts of the ship weren't complete because uh, you know the newer sci fi shows, both Star Trek and in in Star Wars and all, that, they use a lot less practical effects and a lot less set building and all that stuff. A lot of it's green screen, blue screen, mm-hmm. and it's digitally added. So like there's parts of the ship that don't work because they've never actually shown them working on the because it's like, or they were they were never shown on screen. Yeah. But yeah, yeah no, it would have to be like a lot of the stuff, like the new cast would try to logically go through and figure it out. And the old cast would be like, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. We got to do it this way. Like, but that yeah. doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's, but that's what happened in canon. This is canon, guys. Yeah. And then like same with like the the whole, why is there a fire pit in pressers in our engine room? Like, you know, the new Trek hole, we said like, why does our room look like the Budweiser brewery? <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> you know, like yeah, our engine room looks like the Budweiser brewery because it is. We filmed it at the Budweiser brewery. I don't know. I just, I think that if you were to do a sequel, you have to do it in the same tone. It's, it's got to be a love letter, a pastiche and not an, an, an affectionate parody. So, well, let's yeah. just, let's just agree that this movie is one of those that should never get a sequel, but if they were to do a sequel, I don't think it's well, well they're, they're talking about doing a sequel. Now they were, it was, I mean, if Alan Rickman hadn't died in 2016, we probably would have two or three of these by now. Um, well, I think they're doing a mini series. I mean, like, like a net, if they would waited 17 years to do a sequel, I know we've had longer, um, sequels but if they'd had 17 years i don't think we'd get two sequels especially on a like film that this did not make as much in the box office well i mean yeah but i think i just to uh before we we head out and end this episode i would say that the reason why i say that if alan rickman hadn't died that we'd probably have two sequels by now since this movie came out star trek came back so there are new Trek fans. There are old Trek fans that came back to the franchise that I think would help box office numbers of a sequel to this film. Potentially. Yeah. Plus I'm looking it up. Um, Robert Gordon, the one of the writers on this. Yeah. He's a writer for the TV movie galaxy quest that's been announced. So nothing in terms of uh, production or what, you know, when, or if it's even going to be finished, but I mean, they're working on it. So it's a matter of time. How hilarious would it be, though, if they like, did an episode of, like, Lower Decks and, like, the captain and the first officer and all that are voiced by a couple of people from this movie, like Tim Allen and Sigourney Weaver and uh, Tony Shalhoub. Like, that would be hilarious if they had encountered, like, the USS Protector instead of the NSDA <laughs> Protector. Yeah. Like, they encountered the USS Protector and it's the, a couple of the voices are these guys. <laughs> that would be awesome. Right, well, it, for those of uh, our listeners who do watch Lower Decks, if that happens... You heard it here first. Yep. I mean, somebody from Hollywood is listening in on our uh, podcast. Give me my money. <laughs> they are not going to give us the money. 
No, you never do. <laughs> but I think that's it for tonight's show. Um, unless you guys have anything else to add, subtract. I think we've said all we can say about this film. We loved it. All three of us loved it. We'll, you know, gladly watch it again, but not at least for a couple of years. Or maybe you guys, not a couple of years, probably going to be another couple of days. I meant for the show. I meant oh, for the for show. This, yeah. watch it again tomorrow. <laughs> that means such a good show. Just so good. And, and hopefully if anyone listening hasn't watched it yet, I mean, if we're any indication, it's worth the watch. But that's been it for tonight's show. As always, and as a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are sold or just listen to. Our regular episodes, of course, you can find on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Please like and subscribe to us on whatever medium you choose, as we really appreciate it and it really helps us out. And be sure to join our Discord channel as well. Uh, link in the episode's description on our site at firepit.podbean.com. Uh, you get notifications of new episodes as soon as they drop. And even better, it's a fun time. You get to talk to us, and we talk back. Both, like, we, we respond back to your comments. And we talk back, like we were sassy. So, Well, me and Dan do. Tom likes to write books. Yeah, t- whenever Tom shows up, he ty- it shows Tom typing for a half an hour, and then you have to read what he typed for a half an hour. So. Then nobody does, and he kills conversation. Yep. Be able to retire on it. Because that's what it sounds like right now. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. No, that's call it payback. <laughs> so our email is mentioned <laughs> back in the interspersal segment. If you want to send us a long form message like Tom does in Discord, please don't do it in Discord. Send us an email or a short one. Um, it's up to you. But uh, be sure to like our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter. And both are linked in the episode's description as well. And Tom, I do have to uh, say, you say you're actually doing this Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Very brave. He rarely ever gets it out by Tuesday at 6. Super Mario Brothers was an amazing piece of cinema that will forever be remembered. So, anywho, Tom, do you have any shout outs? Well, you know. <laughs> around six. We'll give it around six. Okay. While Josh is pointing out, um, and why I'm, while I'm muting him, I'm going to shout out to some of our Facebook followers Juz Wright, Gary, Carl, and Ken, last names uh, omitted for privacy reasons. Thank you for joining us on facebook and spreading the word about the podcast again we've got a lot to still get through i'm trying to get through at least three or four at a time and we still have a lot more to go so to those who are joining us now or spreading the word or have been with us for a while thank you for popping in and helping to keep these fire pit fires burning and I'll give a special shout out to uh, Peggy, old school friend of the channel, uh, the original friend of the channel. Always appreciate you listening and appreciate the feedback every week on it. Uh, I'd also like to give a special shout out to a work friend of mine, uh, Justin. He's uh, he's over on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash Jabba the Jut. He's over there playing. Yeah, that's his name. It's cool. He's a cool guy. Uh, I work with him. Uh, he's awesome. He's over there on Twitch playing uh, Minecraft, Fortnite, and Call of Duty, whatever the kids are into these days. I don't know. I just play Star Trek online. But he's on Twitch, and uh, I told him I'd give him a special shout-out on his Twitch channel tonight, and he's going to shout us out on his uh, Twitch sometime this week. So Woo-hoo, cross-pollination. Yeah, yeah. So thanks a lot, there, Justin. Thanks for the support, Justin. And uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Sync Lounge and Plex for hosting our viewing uh, parties. They have been flawless, almost flawless, the past few weeks. So thanks for them. And special shout out to Zencaster as well. They've been uh, our new application for how long now? Like the past journey and some change, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, something like yeah. that. Or it was since selection section six. So yeah, at the very beginning of the uh, parade to Punxsutawney. They uh, has been our host for recording our podcast and have saved us more times than we can already count in just the mere eight weeks we've been recording with them. Yes. Oh. And they're free. So yeah, it's um, free. <laughs> yeah. It's been an amazing platform. Mm-hmm. So if you want to start a podcast and this is a, not a paid promo at all, Zencaster is amazing. Yeah. Yes, they are. And speaking of amazing, what amazing film do we have to look forward to next, team? Well, um, everything I do, I do for this podcast. But uh, everything that 
you know, we're going to do next week is going to revolve around stealing and robbing people. If you don't stop, I'm going to cut your heart out with a spoon. Bless you. <laughs> We're going to Robin Hood. But until then, I've been Tom. I've been Dan. And I've been Josh. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. <laughs>